Hello, my name is Christopher Renstrom. I'm the creator of rulingplanets.com and the weekly horoscope columnist for Astrology Hub. And I'm here to welcome you to the premiere episode of Christopher Renstrom Astrology. I wanted to begin the show with a horoscope for the month of February 2024. I'm rather delighted that I'm beginning with a monthly horoscope for February 2024 because February is a month that's associated to the zodiac sign of Aquarius. And Aquarius is often associated to astrology and astrologers. Now, why? Why is Aquarius associated to astrology and astrologers? Is it because people born under Aquarius can be wacky or eccentric or far out? Is it because it's the sign associated with this is the dawning of Aquarius, with the moon being in the seventh house and Jupiter aligning with Mars? Well, not really. The reason why astrology was always associated to Aquarius is because of Urania. Urania was one of the muses, and Urania was the muse of astronomy. That is, the science and the art of foretelling that comes from the stars. Urania gave her name to the planet Uranus, which was discovered in 1781. And at that time, Uranus also happened to become the modern ruler of the zodiac sign of Aquarius. Aquarius has two planetary rulers, Saturn, which is the ancient ruler, and Uranus, which is the modern ruler. And so this is why Uranus, Urania, and astrologers are all associated with the zodiac sign of Aquarius. Aquarius is a sign that often confuses people. A lot of times I'll often hear, Aquarius is an air sign. I thought Aquarius was a water sign. You know, it's got those little squiggly lines. Um, Also, when you look at the image of Aquarius, you usually see a woman with long flowing tresses holding a jug of water and pouring the water out onto the ground. The association of Aquarius and a jug full of water comes from the fact that Aquarius is one of the three winter signs in astrology. Remember that astrology originates in the Northern Hemisphere, in Mesopotamia to be specific, although China could give it a close competition. In any case, Western astrology, which we practice here, uh, originates in Mesopotamia. And uh, the zodiac signs of the winter Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces, if you look at the designs of the signs, the images of the signs, you'll see with a you'll see a goat with a fish's tail. You'll see, um, well, it's not really a woman back then. It's a man, a hulking man with with huge shoulders and bulging biceps holding a jar of water and pouring it. Um, and then you see fishes splashing around. What this indicated was that the winter signs were associated to the water season, the rain, the rainy season in the Northern Hemisphere. And so that's why these particular images are connected to water, the fish-tailed goat, the water-pouring uh, fellow with the jug, and the fish splashing about in the water. This is the wet season here in the Northern Hemisphere. But Aquarius is still an air sign. And so that sort of beggars the uh, idea of just like, how could Aquarius be an air sign and it's associated to water? And then one day it struck me, aha, the reason Aquarius is associated to water is because of clouds. Clouds are the water bearers of our weather system. They carry water, water evaporates into the clouds and they carry it. And when they become heavy enough, they pour the water down on the lands and the lives below. So this is why Aquarius can be an air sign, but also associated with the bearing of water, the bearing of the jug of water and pouring it, because it's basically essentially standing in for a cloud. Also air, air is an element in astrology, which is all about the circulating of ideas. It's all about the circulating of influences. Indeed, the word influence, which means to flow into, Uh, was originally attributed to the influences of the stars in the sky above, or influences that were carried along by the air. It could be word of mouth or ideas, or it could be airborne illnesses, which can be carried by air. But the uh, original idea of, of influence was associated to the stars, and it was connected to the idea that 
the stars emitted a sort of flowing astral energy, which impacted the lives below down on Earth. An air sign is a sign that's very much connected to the communication of ideas, the influence of ideas, having influence on others. Because being an air sign, air signs are associated to relationships that people have with one another. So these are all the ideas I want you to keep in mind as I talk about Aquarius and the forecast for February. The aspect that I want to focus on for the beginning of February is the last quarter moon taking place in the zodiac sign of Scorpio. This refers to one of the phases of the moon. The last quarter moon is basically when the moon is completing its lunar cycle after having left the uh, new moon. It's gone through the first waxing moon, the full moon, and now it's heading back to form a new moon in another sign. So this is the last quarter in a sign that squares the sun. If the sun is in Aquarius, then the last quarter is going to be Scorpio. You go from Scorpio into Aquarius. That's the idea that's being communicated here. So a last quarter moon is associated with the settling of accounts the tying up of loose ends, bringing things to a close. So you don't really want to be beginning things during a last quarter moon. What you want to be doing is finishing them up. You want to be dotting your I's. You want to be crossing your T's. And so there is this idea that, hmm, things are going according to plan. I've engaged on this juncture. I've started this endeavor. And now I'm bringing things to a close. I may be bringing things to a close with finality, and that's going to be it. Or I'm winding up one cycle, and I'm preparing to enter into a new cycle. And that's often associated to the last quarter moon. Uh, some of the ideas that might be connected to this moon, because it's the last quarter moon in the zodiac sign of Scorpio, Something to keep in mind is that the moon is in fall in the zodiac sign of Scorpio. In other words, the moon, which is usually associated to nurturing and to benevolence and to bonding and to intimacy and to the birthing and the raising of families and tribes, in the zodiac sign of Scorpio, there's a sort of calloused quality to the moon. Now, that doesn't mean that people with the moon in Scorpio are calloused. What it means is that people with the moon in Scorpio have lived a lot, okay? And they have the hardened heart to show for it. But that hardened heart is never hard in terms of unfeeling. Scorpio is a water sign. Waters rule the emotions. It's deeply feeling. It's just not exactly trusting, and it's not exactly expressive of it. So when we're dealing with a last quarter moon in Scorpio, in a wintry sign, because it's aspecting Aquarius, we're dealing with, as I said before, the closing of business, the tying up of loose ends, and it's an expectation of starting something new. All right, so it's the idea of like, this has gone according to plan, we're bringing this in for a landing, I'm going to hit my deadline all's well and good. The nature of the Scorpio could bring a heavier idea. It could be perhaps a settling of differences that were very heated at one point. It could be a feeling that I need to close on this idea because if I continue with this enterprise or this endeavor, I'm going to lose more. So I have to stop and sort of quit while I'm ahead. There can be that feeling to a closing moon in Scorpio. Or there can be this feeling that I'm in the last phases and I'm feeling kind of like sad about putting things away, kind of like putting the Christmas tree decorations away after Christmas or the party decorations away after the festivities. There's a sense of, boy, of like, boy, that was fun, but also like, I, I can't believe people put cigarette butts in this beer, in this beer cup. Or, you know, it can be like, oh, I have to air out the room or oh, these were so sweet when they shined on the tree, and I don't want to be one of those neighbors who has their tr Christmas decorations up in July. It's time to put them away. So it's this idea of putting things away. This is supported by a Mercury forming a sextile to Neptune, and on that day of the last quarter moon, 
and the uh, Scorpio sextiling Venus in Capricorn. So that can bring a little bit more of a serious air. It might be, as I said, the settling of accounts or a settling of a dispute. And the way that the dispute is going to be settled might be based on a sort of cutting of losses. You didn't get everything that you wanted, but you don't want to sacrifice anymore. And so there's a cutting of losses. And maybe in a few days from now, you'll say, okay, you know what? It wasn't the best way that I wanted to end it, but it's good that I ended it then. This is the idea of the last quarter moon in Scorpio. And the signs that this will be affecting the most, it affects all the 12 signs of the Zodiac, but the signs that it will be affecting the most will be those people born under Taurus, Cancer, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius. So here we've got this idea of bringing things to a close, right? Not so fast. <laughs> um, and this is the crazy thing about reading the planets in the sky. <clears throat> they can be in agreement for a while, but then they can quickly break and go different directions. Or sometimes they can be in agreement in a while and the following transits continue along that theme. But what we have here happening on February 8th is a Sun-Uranus square. Now, the nature of a square is to be combative. That means that the two planets involved the Sun and Uranus, are combative. They don't see eye to eye. Not only do they not see eye to eye, they're going to try to outshout one another or, or outwit one another or overwhelm or overcome one another. Okay, so there is a combative flavor to a square. Uh, this is something that has been going on uh, for the fixed signs uh, since 2018-2019. Uh, Uranus the reason I uh, invoke 2018-2019 is this is when Uranus entered the fixed sign of Taurus. So since 2018, really starting in 2019, people born under Taurus have been experiencing the disruption of Uranus squaring the sun four times a year. Okay, that is the best laid up the best laid plans are suddenly upset, wild and crazy things come out of left field, and you have to deal with them. Okay, so this affects Taurus, which is a fixed sign. It's also going to affect the other three fixed signs, Leo, Scorpio, and you guessed it, Aquarius. All right, and this is going to have a very strong impact of Aquarius because Uranus is, as I pointed out before, the modern ruler of Aquarius. Okay, so it really hits Aquarius stronger than the others. So there is going to be the Sun-Uranus square, which is going to be an upset, a bolt out of the blue, something coming out of nowhere and hitting and, and, and upsetting the best laid plans. Now, one would think, oh, well, I'm bringing things in for a landing. I'm tying up loose ends. There's that last quarter moon. But the sun Uranus square takes place on the eve, on the day before the new moon. All right. So it's not new moon, which would be like um, the start of something. Someone fires the gun and the racers race ahead. Okay, that's that's a new moon. This square takes place when the moon is heading into a new moon. So it's right at the last notes of a song. It's right at the last words of a narration. It's right at the end of dotting the I's and crossing the T's, and then suddenly something occurs from out of nowhere and upsets your expectations. It upsets your plans, and it upsets what you thought things were going to come together. Think of sports. It's something that happens in sports all the time. There's an upset, you know, uh, uh, everyone was expecting this one team to win and then all of a sudden the other team comes out from behind and snatches victory from the jaws of defeat. So it's that kind of an upset. We can have upsets that are upsetting, which is like, that was really distressing, that was upsetting. And we can have upsets that result in teams being, you know, like uh, spraying bottles of champagne in the locker room and being happy and, you know, throwing around the trophy and like, I can't believe we pulled that off. Wasn't that heroic? Wasn't that exciting? Okay, so this is the nature of that Sun-Uranus square, which takes place right before the new moon, uh, which takes place on the day after it. All right, so there can be this sudden upset in which you thought things were heading in one direction, and suddenly they're heading in another. Okay, and that could result in a disappointment, which is like, wait, wait, that victory was mine, you know, or it could be like, I can't believe we pulled that off. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is the nature, this is the nature of that planetary aspect. 
Now, the signs that will be impacted by this, as I mentioned before, will be the fixed signs, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius. But the other signs that will be impacted by it will be the two air signs, Gemini and Libra, and the fire signs, Aries and Sagittarius. Now, for the fixed signs, the nature of the aspect that I'm describing is either a square or an opposition. Both of those aspects are sort of regarded as being negative in astrology, um, and that's because they're not being consistent. Uh, astrologers, when they followed the stars in the sky, meaning the planets in the skies, they wanted things to be consistent. They didn't want anything to interrupt or to upset the progression of the planets through the sky. And so that's why when planets formed a square or an opposition, which means at opposite ends, which is a polarizing aspect, these were seen as negative because they were upsetting. Things weren't going according to plan. It was like bad planets. You're, you're, you're acting out and misbehaving planets. Okay, but when we had aspects like a trine or a sextile, a trine is whenever a planet um, is aspecting a planet in another sign that has the same element, okay? And a sextile is when the uh, signs are joined by uh, either their yin relationship to one another or their yang relationship to one another. Well, long story short, these are good. So what could be distressing or disturbing for the fixed signs, for the signs of Gemini and Libra, and for the signs Aries and Sagittarius, they could actually be quite good. In other words, if we were to sort of separate people from the, this didn't go the way I wanted it to go, Urgh. okay, that might be more the fixed signs. And if we were to bring it back to the people who are like, oh, I can't believe I snatched this victory out of the laws of defeat, that might be the air or fire signs. The person who catches the bridal bouquet and I can't believe I caught it. I'm getting married next. Okay, so there can be this kind of like accidental quality, which moves those signs ahead on the game board of the astrological chart. So this may actually be beneficial for those signs that I just mentioned. Now, the next dates that I would like to focus on are February 5th, February 14th, and February 17th. To me, these are remarkable dates because these are the dates when Mercury, Mars, and Venus enter the zodiac sign of Aquarius and make their first conjunctions to Pluto. This to me is very important, these first initial conjunctions that they make. Indeed, on February 5th, Mercury not only enters Aquarius, but it conjoins Pluto on the very same day. And on February 13th, Mars enters Aquarius. And on February 14th, just in time for Valentine's Day, Mars forms its conjunction to Pluto. February uh, 16th is when Venus enters Aquarius. And then, of course, on February 17th, Venus forms a conjunction to Pluto. Now, that's more astrology than anyone should ever have to sit through. So let me break this down for you. We have a planet entering a sign. Mercury enters the zodiac sign of Aquarius, where Pluto already is, and it forms a conjunction. Okay, a conjunction is when two planets are at the same place at the same time. Okay, so this is a Mercury-Pluto conjunction. In many ways, a conjunction of planets, when you're talking about a transiting planet, can almost be that moment when, um, you know, someone who's, let's let's go back to that foot race, when someone at the race is like on your mark or or, or someone's about to wrestle or something like that, and they, or, or someone's about to dive into the pool, the whole swim team is going to dive in the pool. And what they do is that they hit that stopwatch. This is the moment when things begin is in the conjunction. Mercury conjoins Pluto, and that's going to be a beginning. That's when the stopwatch is hit, and it starts going tick, 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 around, all right? That stopwatch is going to end when Mercury leaves the zodiac sign of Aquarius. That's when it's tick, we take that off. So these are kind of mini ways of reading a planet in a sign when you're talking about a transit. But again, I'm getting too ahead of myself here. So Mercury forms a conjunction to Pluto. This is their first initial conjunction. So what this Mercury will do is that it will trigger Plutonian energy. On the other day that I invoked, February 14th, this is when Mars forms its first conjunction to Pluto. This is the most powerful, okay? Mars and Pluto will be 
Um, it's it's right at this conjunction. And then, of course, as I said, February 17th is going to be when Venus conjoins Pluto. <laughs> What's this all about? Pluto is named after the Greek god of the underworld. He ruled over things that were buried underneath the ground, things like corpses and things like seeds, like we bury seeds and, and watch them sprout and grow in the spring. Pluto also ruled over ruins and artifacts and things that were buried under the earth. And Pluto also ruled over things like gold and silver and precious metals. In fact, Pluto lent its name to the word plutocracy, which means the money or the wealthy class. So Pluto was a word, it is a word that's associated with wealth, and so is the planet Pluto itself. It's associated with things that are buried under the earth. In other words, they're not something that you're going to find in your day-to-day -day life. They're things that are hidden. They are things that are underfoot, that can refer to inner resources, or it can refer to bargains or deals that you make with the devil, something that used to be referred to back in the day as Faustian bargains. So whenever you have a planet forming a conjunction to Pluto, things take on a life or death intensity. It's not an urgency. It's not Mars. It's a life or death intensity. The stakes are as high as they could possibly be. Okay, so if you have Mercury forming a conjunction to Pluto like it does on February 5th, what you say has high stakes. It carries a lot of weight. It may carry a lot of weight in a negotiation. It may carry a lot of weight in a deal. It may carry a lot of weight because you're about to tell someone that you're not in love with them and you're going to break their heart. It may carry a lot of weight because you're going to vote thumbs down and the hopes of the electorate have been dashed. Okay, so, so, so what you say, what you signal based on your thoughts and your beliefs and the way that you communicate is going to carry a lot of weight. Mercury is also the planet of scribes. So whatever you sign, on that day, or in the days leading up to that day, whatever you sign, whatever you agree to, whatever the transaction, it carries a lot of weight. It feels like life and death stakes, that the stakes are terribly high. And so there might be a sense of like, well, maybe I don't want to do this. Or there might be like, yes, I'm going to do this against, I'm, I'm going to go against my doubts and anxieties, and I'm going to do this. Or it may be like, Phew, this is going to get me in a lot of trouble, but I'm in. Okay, so these are the ideas that we want to associate to this Mercury-Pluto conjunction. What might also be associated to a conjunction is a revelation, a discovery, some news that surfaces or that you hear about. Do I disclose this? Do I share this? This has life and death stakes. I just saw my best friend's spouse cheating on my best friend. Do I disclose this? Am I going to be the bearer of bad news? Life and death stakes, things that have weighty consequences. So this is going to be associated to the February 5th. The February 14th, the Mars conjunct Pluto. Uh, these are the two planets that rule the zodiac sign of Scorpio, by the way. Um, <clears throat> Mars and Pluto form a conjunction. And so if Mercury is what I say, and what I say is going to carry this kind of weight, with a Mars-Pluto conjunction, what I do is going to carry that weight, all right? The action that I take, all right? I'm, I'm, I, I know this is going to upset people, but I'm going to go ahead and follow this through. I know that this is going to upset people, but I'm going to go ahead and say, things have come to an end. I know this is going to upset people, but I need to act in the best interests of what I think is right. So anything which is an action that you take that's Mars, when it conjoins Pluto, is going to have heavy repercussions. It's not something that you can take back again. It's not something that you can go, whoops. You know, it's, it's something that, you know, this is the action you're going to take. When we're dealing with planets moving through a zodiac sign like Aquarius, these planets are colored by the temper, by the character of Aquarius. Aquarius is not a fast sign, okay? Aquarius is not a sign that does things urgently. 
Aquarius likes to take things slow and steady in an airy, in an intellectual, in a cerebral way. Okay, it wants to basically go along the lines of a formula. And because Aquarius is so concerned about the nature of other people, it wants to do what's going to be good for everyone involved and not just a small corner of the picture. Aquarians stand on principle, um, the way that Scorpios can stand on their vendettas, right? So sorry, <laughs> but I couldn't resist. Okay. You know how Scorpions can take action that might be contrary to their best interest and it's done out of, people think it's spite and anger, and actually it is done out of spite and anger, but it's done out of an anger. It's done out of having been hurt. Uh, uh, scor uh, scorpions are rarely uh, malicious for malice's sake. Um, they'll they'll do it because there's been a history of 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 injustice or wrongs being done. And sometimes uh, Scorpios will do something which is contrary. It looks like it's spiteful, but it's done from a place of an emotional truth or an emotional expression of power. Aquarians do the same thing, but they will do it based on principle. They may feel torn about the consequences of what they're going to do, but it's going to be something based on principle. Now, even if you're not an Aquarius, let's say you're a Capricorn or you're a Sagittarius, there's still going to be this idea that the action that's being asked of you, the action that you're confronted with, is going to have very serious consequences. And depending on your investment in that idea, depending on your relationship to that idea, as a Capricorn, you might decide this isn't really worth it. You know, I'm not really going to do this. As a Sagittarius, you might be like, ooh, wow, that's really going to upset a lot of things in my life. I think I'm going to skip this one. Okay, those might be options that are available to you. Although with the Sagittarius, I would caution you to take a second look at it, because even though the action may have a, a very high cost to it, uh, the chances are it's going to move you forward. Remember, Aquarius energy moves you forward if you're a Sagittarius or an Aquarius. So what we're really kind of talking about here is the cost of this action. You know, what? what is the cost you're willing to pay? And so when we get to the conjunction of Venus uh, conjoining Pluto on February 17th, what is going to be the cost of your relationships? Okay, Venus is all about relationships. The moon very quickly is about feelings and the inner emotional life. And Venus, Venus is all about relationships, the relationships you have with other people. And so with Pluto conjoining Venus on February 17th, what is the price you're willing to pay um, based on a relationship or an alliance? Um, a lot of times people think of Venus as being uh, romantic. You know, the price is a romantic price. Uh, um, um, I've, I've fallen for someone who's taken my eyes away from this loveless marriage, and I'm going to leave this loveless marriage, and I'm going to follow this person I've fallen in love with. This is a common idea. But it can really be, um, it can really be, if I change alliances, or if I stand by this alliance, what's the price that I'm going to pay? Okay. Aquarians will be like, okay, that's a steep price, but what I'm doing is right, and it's for the good of all, so I'm going to stand by this. An Aquarian might even be like, that's a heavy cost, and um, and I'm not, I, I, I don't think it's worth it, and I'm going to take the consequences of this. This is something that each of the fixed signs, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, Aquarius, will be facing at this time. But as I said before, in the structure of sextiles and trines, this may actually be benefiting the Geminis and the Libras. It may be benefiting the Aries and the Sagittarians. You signs may have moment for pause where you're really wondering what you're going to get out of all of this, but <clears throat> there may be something to this price that has to be paid in which the cost won't be so heavy on you. It won't be so daunting like it will be for the fixed signs. And these are things to keep in mind. An alliance, as I said, can be romantic, but it can also be an alliance outside the family. Venus usually rules over relationships outside the family. Family relationships are pretty much ruled by the moon. So Venus may rule relationships outside the family, like I'm going to uh, upset my family by being with this person. Or uh, Venus is going to rule over business 
alliances, political alliances, social alliances. You might find yourself in a situation at work where you're standing up for a colleague or a friend who is not popular at the moment. And do you stand by this person? Or are you like, wow, this person's not popular at the moment. I might want to make a little distance. Okay, these are the things that are going to be connected to this period of time where Pluto is looking you straight in the eye and saying, how much do you really want this? Okay, what's the cost? What's the price you're willing to pay? And when Pluto has those conversations, it's with an unwavering stare, and it's something that really goes down into the depth of your being. So when we move to February 21st and 22nd, we have the consequence of these decisions. We have the consequence of these words. We have the consequence of these actions. We have the consequence of these choices vis-a-vis -a, -vis a relationship. Why do we have the consequence? On February 21st, the moon is in Leo. It forms an opposition to Venus and Mars. Why is this important? Because on February 22nd, Venus and Mars form a conjunction. This is the betrothal. This is the signing of the agreement. This is two parties coming together and forming this relationship, forming this alliance. This is when it's done. Okay. And with the moon being in Leo, the moon is going to be out of sorts. So in other words, uh, what this talks about, whatever the alliance, if it's a romantic alliance, if it's um, a political alliance, if it's a professional alliance, if it's a social alliance, if it's, you know, choosing one friend over another, okay, it's going to have an emotional impact because of the opposition to the moon in Leo, and it's going to be a very loud impact. It's going to be the impact that was heard around the neighborhood or heard around the corporate offices or heard around the world, okay? It's going to have a very strong response that's gone to it. So, if you are in the position where you are going to speak these words at a cost, where you're going to take these actions at a cost, where you're going to choose this relationship at a cost, um, you this is when you find out really how steep that cost is. Um, the nature of Venus and Mars in Aquarius um, is air and it's fixed air. So um, the, whatever the choice or the decision, it will have, it's, it's interesting the way the stars describe it, it will have an emotional impact, but the people involved in it are making it from a very um, cerebral, uh, studied, uh, intellectual almost place. Or maybe it's simply a rule and a law place, which is also falls within the domain of air. So it's not a rash decision. It's not reckless. It's not quick. It's going to be solid. It's going to be steady. There will be upsets uh, to you, or you might be on the side who is experiencing the upsets. On February 18th, the sun leaves the zodiac sign of Aquarius, and it moves into the zodiac sign of Pisces. And so we have a shift where the emphasis in February was very much on the air and the fire signs, mostly air, some fire. Okay, the shift is now with the sun moving into the zodiac sign of Pisces. The shift is going to be more towards the earth and water signs. In other words, the focus of the stars will be more on the earth and the water signs, particularly Pisces, because when the sun enters the zodiac sign of Pisces, we are in Pisces season. So people born under the zodiac sign of Pisces will feel that strength that happens when the sun is moving through their sign. They will feel replenished, they will feel restored, and they will feel like they're the next ones up at bat, which is basically almost the feeling as the sun goes from sign to sign to sign. This entrance into Pisces is of a different tone. It's of a different feel. It's more emotional. It's more soft-spoken. It's not life and death stakes. It's, it's dealing much more with the soothing waters of Pisces. So as the sun enters Pisces, which is a water sign, and, uh, and it's a mutable sign, um, things aren't going to be as hardened or as extreme as life can get under the fixed signs. Fixed signs can get a bit do or die. Uh, when you enter into the mutable signs, the mutable signs are like, okay, 
That's what went down in the previous sign. What can we salvage of the situation or what can we do to make the situation work? So there is kind of a salvaging energy to the mutable signs or a let me see what I can do to make this work idea with the mutable signs. Mm -hmm. But with Pisces, there can be a restorative flavor or a restorative energy. And the way that Pisces often like to sort of restore things is to change the subject. Okay, so if that's what went down before, let's move on to this other idea. There may be this sense of like, okay, and we're moving on to something new. This is new interest, and this will hopefully be more restorative and more agreeable in the zodiac sign of Pisces. Why is the energy going to be more agreeable? Um, because it is the nature of Jupiter to be more agreeable, and Jupiter is the traditional ruler of Pisces. But the first planet that we're going to encounter uh, when the sun enters Pisces is going to be Mercury and then Saturn. And that's going to be very interesting because Mercury, again, is the planet of messages and it's not on its strongest footing in Pisces. And so the sun conjoins Mercury and then it conjoins Saturn both on the same day, which is February 28th. And so that might be a day in which you experience some kind of disappointment. This isn't going to work. If you're launching something, this might almost be, it stops before it started. It's kind of like something going over like with a lead balloon because Saturn conjunctions in these early degrees of a sign could be a lot like something being over before it really truly began. And so that might be the idea. There might be some sort of disappointment. Is it a crushing disappointment? Is it on the level of what we are talking about with those Pluto conjunctions? No. It's not a crushing disappointment. We're dealing with Saturn. It's a disappointment. And because we're dealing with Saturn, we're dealing with the idea of like, I didn't really think it was going to work. Okay. So whenever you have a Saturn conjunction like this, it's like, I didn't really think it was going to work, but I gave it a try. And that's the Mercury. So with Saturn, there's a kind of like expectation that this wasn't going to really work out. And so it didn't work out. And so you're sort of like, hmm, okay, it didn't really work out. So you're not... You're not terribly disappointed. Your star didn't fall from the sky. You kind of thought it was, and you kind of were hoping, and it didn't, and okay, I, I can live with it. This isn't tremendously crushing. But what's really nice is on the following day, February 29th, there's this lovely little Mercury-Jupiter sextile that takes place. The Mercury-Saturn conjunction on February 28th it's like you went to one parent and your parents said, no, not at all. And so on February 29th, you go to the other parent and it's a Mercury sextile with Jupiter and, and Jupiter rules Pisces. And so the other parent is like, let me talk to your father about that. So that's what's nice about that little transition there. You might get a no. It's a disappointment. Not something that's going to ruin your life. But Mercury is never one to leave something alone. Mercury will always go and check, is there another avenue? Is there another path? There's another way I can get to something like this. And so Mercury is going to go to Jupiter. It forms a sextile to Jupiter. Sextiles are good. And Jupiter is going to say, let me see what I can do about it. And so this is the lovely up note. This is the delicious up note that people born under Cancer, Virgo, Capricorn, and Pisces are going to experience at the end of February 2024.